In this video, we'll examine the central nervous system further by beginning to look at the brain. The brain has two major areas, the forebrain, which consists of the cerebrum externally, and the thalamus, reticular formation, hypothalamus, basal nuclei, extrapyramidal system, and the limbic system internally. The hindbrain consists of the pons, cerebellum, and the medulla oblongata. The cerebrum makes up 80% of the brain mass in humans. It's responsible for higher brain functions, the ability to learn, the ability to remember, self-awareness, consciousness, and intelligence. There are two cerebral hemispheres seen here, the left and the right side. If we could shrink down and walk along the surface of the brain, we'd come to sort of a drop off or a cliff and we'd fall down that cliff until we reached a solid area. This solid area is a major nerve tract area where nerves run back and forth between the left and right side of the brain so the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain can communicate with one another. This area is known as the corpus callosum. It's a large internal fiber tract which connects the right and left sides of the brain. If surgically cut as used to be the case with very severe epileptics, the left and right side of the brain are isolated from each other. The cerebral cortex is the outer layer of the cerebrum. It's composed of gray matter and it's not too much thicker than the thickness of a hair. The convolutions increase the surface area of the cerebral cortex where the gray matter is and it means that more cerebral cortex can be fit into the limited size of our skull. The cerebral cortex contains four lobes. The frontal lobe, which is where the primary motor area is. It's where motor responses originate. So if you want to move your foot or your arm or blink consciously, this is the part of the brain that's active. If damaged at birth due to a lack of oxygen, cerebral palsy may result. And this is the spastic weakness in arms and legs. The frontal lobe is sort of the seat of our creativity. And it's also the seat of our personality. In fact, the very front region of the frontal lobe is known as the prefrontal lobe and damage to it can actually change personality. In the past very aggressive patients in institutions might have had something called a prefrontal lobotomy where this portion of the brain was actually removed. It resulted in very severe changes in personality and was dehumanizing. The parietal lobe contains a sensory area immediately behind the motor area of the frontal lobe and in fact the areas mirror one another as we'll see shortly. Body regions with the highest density of receptors are represented with the largest areas here and the parietal lobe is also involved in short-term memory. The temporal lobes, there's one on each side, is where the primary auditory centers are located and this makes a lot of sense because the ears would lie externally right in this area. It processes all information related to hearing. It also processes olfactory or smell and some visual stimuli as well. It's responsible for long-term memory. At the very back is the occipital lobe and the occipital lobe is where our primary visual receptive and processing areas are. It controls voluntary movements and degeneration of this area results in Parkinson's disease which includes rigidity, tremors and difficulty initiating voluntary motions. The cerebral cortex has been mapped and long before we had MRIs and CT scans primary cortex mapping took place during brain surgery where the patient would be anesthetized and then a portion of the skull would be removed and they'd be revived with their skull off. Then electrical stimuli would be used to stimulate different parts of the brain and the doctors would look to see what the response of the patients would be. They might move a leg or they might experience a sensation in their hands or their arms and they would consciously be able to tell the doctors what they were experiencing. Now they didn't do this just for the sake of experimentation because that would be unethical. 
the reason that they may have done the brain mapping was because the patient required brain surgery perhaps to uh, get at a growth like a tumor and the doctors wanted to minimize damage to portions of the brain that would be critical for things like movement or sensation. So the resulting brain map uh, is shown in a simplified model here. This is the mitten model and you can see that this is the left side of the brain. It looks kind of like a mitten if you put your hand up against it. Um, a thumb and then an area for the fingers. And we can see the frontal, parietal, temporal and occipital lobes. And you can see some of the major things that each one of these areas is responsible for. Note especially that the motor areas in the frontal lobe mirror the sensory areas in the parietal lobe. In our next video we'll take a look at the internal brain.